Greetings. So let me introduce my fantastic panel to you. We have the co-director of the Center of Excellence in Nanomedicine and Engineering from UC San Diego. Not quite UCLA, but you know, we can't <laughs> all uh, be Bruins. Go Professor, Tritons, yeah. <laughs> Professor Ada Almutari, one of Forbes' top 10 most influential female engineers in the world. She holds hundreds of patents around the world. And Dr. Frank Cordasco, MD, MS, who's Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Award-winning for his research, he's published many pap papers and chapters in books, highly sought after specialist in sports medicine. When I told my friends that I had a, an ACL specialist, they all said, oh, wait, can they, you ask him about my knee? So let me ask you, first of all, to start to speak from your perspective on the place in health and medicine where you'd like to see the most substantial increase in investment, both short-term and long-term. Professor Ada. Um, thank you, Edie, for giving me this opportunity to speak on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we've heard a lot today about human longevity. The way I look at human longevity, I, I think more of less of the overall lifespan and more of the quality of life during your lifespan. I think of it more of a public health, um, and I think Frank and I agreed on that. Um, it's more of a public health uh, topic. How do you live a healthy yeah, uh, lifespan? The health span. And economically, it is of great interest because you reduce the health care burden on the economy when you have a healthier population. Uh, a big predictor of economic prosperity is more, um, more overall life expectancy right. and healthy life expectancy. So if I was an advising, and I do advise investors, I would say, and government officials, I would say for sure to focus on a healthy working population over, and it's tied into human longevity. Interesting. Dr. Cordasco, what do you well, think? Well, Edie, first off, thank you for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. It's a privilege, and uh, particularly since I'm sitting next to a thought leader in translational research. So from my perspective, it's a bit biased. I feel that musculoskeletal health has often been overlooked as a non-communicable disease. Uh, certainly, if you look back 60, 70 years, most of the financing from government and private investments in non-communicable diseases have been in those high mortality diseases, cardiovascular, stroke, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, all of which are very, very important. I think MSK Health, if you look at the data, the majority of visits MSK to stands for musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal health. Okay. I'm sorry. Thanks Got for it. clarifying. It's all right. I'm the jargon checker. So for MSK health, it's easier to use the initials. I, I think one of the overlooked factors is that more than half of the visits to providers of care around the world are related to MSK disorders and health. And it covers the vast majority, and we've discussed this, of age groups, children, adolescents, young adults, middle-aged adults who are the most productive in various uh, aspects of society, and of course the elderly. Mm. And so this is important not just in the industrialized world, but in subst subsistence societies as well as in indigenous societies. So when you lose the ability to move, humans mm. were meant to move, you create a situation that's not healthy, getting back to the questions of a healthy life, not just a long life. So longevity with health and with mobility. So and, I think, go ahead. And to that, um, when we were talking, Frank, we both agree that the number one longevity organ is muscle. And it's yes. the greatest predictor of lifespan is strength. And you both for metabolic function and for uh, endocrine function. That's true. But you've also mentioned ovaries, which are important. Maybe you could touch oh, on that. Oh, yes. So when we were talking about what's on our mind, we talked about one, one area that I think is overlooked, thank you for reminding me, is uh, the study of ovaries because it's the number one fastest aging organ in the, in the human body. And it would uh, create a great, I'm, as you said, I'm a translational scientist, and it would be a great aging model because between the age of 35 to 50, women, their ovaries age by 35 years. So it's almost double, more than double uh, the aging process happens. And so just taking those cells and studying the process that happens, it could be a great predictor for how do we better understand aging and, and therefore control it. And it would have effects, ramifications and ripple effects in uh, birth rates, I would, I would presume. Um, 
And if we can, you know, optimize that process, it would relieve a big burden, I think, on women that are in, you know, in the thick of their careers, uh, but also thinking about, okay, do I want to mm. have babies because my biological clock is ticking? Do you think that's an area where we could see um, rejuvenative, rejuvenative, rejuvenative medicine have an interest? Because if we're, you're looking at age cells that age faster than other cells in the body, would those be the ones to look at to see if we could roll back the clock on? Yes, uh, absolutely. We could, I mean, I envision, it's not my area, but uh, I have, I've been one of the ones that developed disease in a dish models. Mm -hmm. Tell not, us a little bit about that. These are just very simple kits, tools to create uh, models of human tissue that mm -hmm. biologists, I'm not a biologist, but biologists can uh, put in stem cells that can then be pushed along to certain types of progenitor cells, we call them in the field, and they can help study uh, uh, neuroscience or neurology diseases, cardiovascular diseases, mm -hmm. and in the case of, um, like I said, in, in ovary cells, right, mm -hmm. and how they they age to study them in a dish. Interesting. Because animal models don't really work for aging, and it, it doesn't make sense to have a study that is mm. 85 years old when you can do it in a dish and have an accelerated model, mm. something that within a 15-year study can tell you what happens. So some of these things sound complicated, scientific, you need a lab. But Frank, some of the interventions that you advocate for actually don't sound like they're that expensive, and they can have a huge impact. Like teaching girls how to jump on and off of a box. Right. So from my standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm predominantly a, a, tr a sports medicine surgeon, which by definition relates to trauma. So people come to see me because they've torn ligaments or torn tendons, occasionally older adults who tear tendons based upon senescence. But uh, where I come from, just by way of background, I'm at the Hospital for Special Surgery. As Edie mentioned, we have 155 orthopedic surgeons. So we all develop niches over our career. And so I'm not speaking so much about total joint replacements, uh, spine surgery, hand or foot and ankle. Mm. But knee and shoulder injuries in young people is, is, are a big problem. And so one of the things that we try to do is prevent them on the front end before they develop a problem. And one way to do that, and we've seen this in the States and in, in uh, the UK and Europe, women genetically, and there is some, while there's a gender specific difference, there's obviously crossover. But if you watched uh, 100 middle school children jump from an 18 inch box and you compared 50 girls to 50 boys, you would see that the boys tend to land in a very crouched situation mm -hmm. like they're ready for battle and the girls would uh, sort of land in a semi-erect maybe their knees were bent 15 degrees or so and that's a setup for a torn ACL mm. so just by reaching out and the beauty post pandemic is that we can educate from afar mm. so we could educate in the global south using very simple technology in the s public school systems the school systems etc and hopefully prevent some of those mm. ACL injuries interesting mm. so We've talked about AI, I think, in every single one of the panels. I know that AI is already affecting your work. Tell us a little bit about um, how it's directly affecting your work now and also where you see it in the future, Professor Da. Well, I think Frank and I would agree that it's already being used in training and such. Radiologists, for example, use it as to triage uh, as a tool, and, and I'll let um, Frank discuss that more. In, in terms of translational medicine, AI is critical for analyzing big data, collecting longitudinal data, analyzing it, coming up with patterns. We've been using it, um, you know, for a very, very long time in, in all the omics, genomics, mm -hmm. yeah. metabolomics, uh, proteomics. It's obviously been, been around and been a tool for scientists for such a long time and a critical tool. Um, I see it as important in terms of one of the Aside from longevity, I think uh, when it comes to genetic disorders, you know, mm -hmm. not lifestyle or aging disorders, it's very, it's going to play and does play a cl critical role in analyzing genomics and helping with CRISPR, Cas9 type of gene editing um, technologies that are mm -hmm. currently on the cusp of becoming clinically available. Very exciting time, I think. Probably one of the fastest translation of a basic breakthrough. Uh, into the clinic, and I think every investor in the room should have their eye on uh, this field in general of gene editing therapies. Let's talk about that in a minute, but just on this issue of AI, I think you mentioned to me that 
The most, the number one used app in the world, which uses AI, is Flow. Is that right? Yes, which tracks uh, female menstrual cycle. Yeah, number one, 100 million users. I mean, so you could actually you analyze that data anonymously yeah. to do some really correct. interesting things. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes, imagine that. That really requires AI to take all that data yeah. from 100 million users over their lifespan. Yeah, interesting. Frank, give us a sense of, of how AI is being used now in surgery and also where you see it in the future. Sure. So as Ada mentioned, it's been around for a while in, in orthopedics. So we started using uh, virtual reality as part of the education process for trainees about eight years ago mm -hmm. uh, as part of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons. I was in the presidential line at the time and we established uh, essentially virtual reality to train medical students and residents before they got to the operating room. Just as, a, as an aside, uh, the term resident came from the fact that young trainees in the early 1900s lived in the hospital. They were actually residents of the mm. hospital. Thankfully, that's no longer the case, but over mm. the last 30 years, at least in the United States, there have been changes in work uh, uh, parameters such that the residents are spending less and less time in the hospital and in the operating rooms, and yet the length of training is the same. So anything we can do to expedite their training early on outside of the OR gives them a leg up once they get to the operating room. So that's virtual reality. And as you mentioned, Edie, augmented reality is used right now and has been used for the last five to seven years mm. in the operating rooms. The low-hanging fruit in orthopedics has been joint replacement surgery and spine because it's bone work. Mm -hmm. So you can obtain preoperative imaging with 3D, uh, three-dimensional imaging, usually CT scan, but occasionally MRI and identify the parameters that you're using to, for example, perform a total knee replacement, and then using that image preoperatively in the operating room, you can then use it to fashion with the use of a robot. Mm. Uh, so robotic technology has been around, for, again, for a long time, but marrying those two with augmented reality has really been a, a big uh, boon because it improves the rep reproducibility and the predictability of the alignment, for example, for a total knee, as well as for placing pedicle screws in the spine. Mm. So it improves the accuracy, it diminishes the operative time, and it also diminishes the radiation uh, to the patient, to the surgeon, and to the medical staff in the operating room, which is also critically important. So it's, it's a big part of what's done yeah. on a daily basis. I had, um, I had surgery earlier this year, and it was a robotic assisted by the Da Vinci, which we spoke about in a previous panel. In fact, without that, without that robot, I would have lost my whole kidney. Uh, but the robot plus the surgeon enabled me to keep most of the kidney. And that video has been used to already train other surgeons. So it's, it's, and you could hear, actually, when I listened to the surgery, you can hear him explaining for the future, for future surgeons, about what he was doing in that particular case. I want to make sure we get to gene editing and tell me why it's so important for the future of healthcare. Well, we taught, you know, you've got, you've got the diseases that you can have some sort of lifestyle control over. In terms of ge genetic diseases, you, you don't. But thankfully, we have this method of, it's almost like the power of word processing where you do uh, cut paste or control find and you mm -hmm. find what you want you cut it out and you put in a new word it's almost that level of accuracy hmm. that we never had in the 80s when genetic uh, genetic engineering was first a buzzword and um, one thing to appreciate is that it's totally different genetic editing from genetic engineering it's mm. it's about accuracy uh, it is very complicated still. We're in the very early stages, mm. meaning diseases are uh, many, many different genes involved in a certain disease, but in some diseases, like in sickle cell anemia and in ALS, muscular uh, dystrophy, it's much more simple. It's just one gene edited, mm. and they've already had success. So now that these are successful clinical trials and are about to be FDA approved in the US, I think they're one, sickle cell anemia is already approved in England. Mm. Now we can see how um, we, it's, a, it's almost the tip of the iceberg for other genetic diseases. Mm. I want to finish, Frank, on something that I think might be interesting to people here that they might not think about. Why is dancing such a good way to live a f longer health and watch your knees as yeah. well? Well, that's a great question, uh, Edie. And, you know, I've had the privilege of taking care of professional dancers. I'm speaking ballet, modern dance over the course of my career, as well as 
field and, and court sport athletes. And so sports are a big part of our lives. And you know, thankfully, we see uh, our host uh, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Sports have taken on a huge, huge part of society. And it, and it is that in the West, as we all know. Dancers tend to have a very strong core and they rarely tear their ACLs. It happens, but it's much more common in field and sport court athletes. So if we watch what dancers do, and this gets back to educating uh, mm. in the global south, most indigenous societies dance as part of their life. Mm. And so if we could co-opt that and use it to educate young people, I think that would be a, a big plus. Just one thing to add, Edie, if we have a moment. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't mention IoT. So I think wearable technology in sports is, has become huge. Uh, as we all know, uh, we can evaluate professional athletes, collegiate athletes. It helps on the sports performance side. It also helps on the sports, uh, the, the preventative side as mm. it gets back to preventing, say, Tommy John surgery in professional baseball pitchers or concussions in collision sports, soccer and otherwise. So mm. that's another area I would encourage everyone to invest in. I think if you invest in MSK Health, you're going to be a winner assuming you do your due diligence on all of the metrics. Great. Thank you so much to Frank, well to Ada as well, and thank you to the audience for giving them a warm welcome. Thank you, thank guys. Thank you, Edie. Thank Cheers. you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.